so one of the things I said that I really want to focus on is if you don't have a team, you can build one. In fact, we're going to be giving you some options when Pastor Abed uh, does our Q&A with us. We're going to actually consider some, uh, share some options that you can consider uh, of things you can do. Either uh, we can come and meet with your team. Um, we can come and speak to your church and your team, or we even have a Bible college that we can uh, have you attend if you're local or you want to do the drive. They say a church alive is worth the drive, amen? And how many know for education, you'll drive wherever you got to go to get it? So it's important that you know that. We also are rewriting or writing for the first time our own curriculum. Uh, we've been through a couple different um, courses that we've gone through, one degree program and another that is um, for more certificate um uh, uh, leadership training, and uh, we were doing uh, a certain course for a couple years. I'll leave the name out. Um, but we're actually writing our own, and that's going to be available through Passion Pastors to be able to, to even have something like that at your church or to be trained here. So we, we're actually pushing back our fall semester to January and kind of start in, in, uh, after winter into going towards spring. So we're actually taking our Bible college students and under, uh, under my leadership, we're going to actually be meeting t- week after week, the normal time that they'd be in class for the time that they're not in school. And we're going to be putting together from our own sermons, our own leadership principles, and the things that we normally do here at Destiny, we're going to be putting it together into curriculum that will be able to raise up leaders, not just a year one and year two student, but we're actually adding a third year for internship. And that's something that could be a model that your churches could have. Not only do you need to teach them, how many know you need to train them? That means they need to be trained right alongside you and see what you do. So when we talk about uh, preaching, I have a, a, a statement that I've been saying the last few days, and I think you could probably uh, take this into your own life. If you try to preach everything, they won't leave with anything. In other words, you can't preach everything in every sermon. I mean, I know you want to get them there, so you want attendance. I know you want them to tithe because you need to pay the bills. I understand that you want leaders, so you want to speak to volunteers. I understand you want people healed, so you preach on healing. You want people saved, so you have that altar call. You try to get them saved every single week, and the same people keep getting saved every single week. But you can't do everything all the time. So if you try to preach everything, they leave. They don't leave with anything because there's too much to process. And really, people are like children at heart. We enter the kingdom as little children. That means we learn. The prophet said in Isaiah 28, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It's interesting. In Hebrew, it's a nursery rhyme. It's actually sav la sav, sav la sav, kav la kav, kav la kav, ze'er sham, ze'er sham. And it's literally patterned poetically like a nursery rhyme because what he's saying is, you're about to go to Babylon and learn from another language, a tongue you don't understand, because when I spoke to you in your own language, you wouldn't listen. So you're going to have to be quickly drawn from the breasts, weaned from the milk, because the Torah was milk to the rabbis. And so when a babe desires the sincere milk of the word, he's actually starting with the first principles of the oracles of God, which is the books of Moses. And so Genesis to Deuteronomy are the five books that Jesus grew up with as a child. It's the same five books that Timothy learned from. That when you were a child, Timothy, you learned the principles of the Torah. Then they would learn the prophets, and the prophets would start all the way from Joshua, the book right after Deuteronomy, go all the way to Malachi as the second section of the, of the, of the Old Testament or what they call the Hebrew Scriptures. The third, third section is called the writings. Josephus called them the royal writings, and they start with the book of Psalms. Do you remember when Jesus resurrected from the dead? He said on that road to Emmaus, he told them, well, didn't you read in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms? And it says he started with Moses, meaning the Torah. He moved on to the prophets, and then he began to break down the scriptures, scriptura, which means writings. And so these three sections of the Old Testament are still the same three sections that the Jews teach now from childhood to adulthood. The problem is most Christians don't even know their Old Testament. So what they have is a quarter of their Bible that they're learning to live off a diet that is limited to sweets and desserts. If you let a kid pick their meal, they will go for the sugar every time. So we're preaching the sweetness of Jesus, but we haven't given them the milk that lets them grow into Jesus. 
Because until you have milk, you can't handle bread. And if you haven't had bread, you can't handle meat. And we're trying to give meat to people from the New Testament when they haven't heard the foundation of the milk. Because they were drastically taken out of Israel from the breast of the receiving from El Shaddai, the many-breasted, all-sufficient God of more than enough. If you read El Shaddai, Shaddai comes from the word Shad, meaning breast, because God is the supplier of milk. So therefore, the Almighty is the supplier of what you need. And so this concept of milk is essential in Jewish thought. And it's essential in first century model Christianity because the, the first Christians were Jews. So therefore, when you think the mind of Christ, you've got to put on your spiritual yarmulke and think like a Jew. doesn't mean you have to be Jewish. It means you have to think like a Jew. Because when in Rome... You do as the Romans. When in Egypt, you're going to work like a Hebrew slave. But when you're in the promised land, we're free to be who we're meant to be. Amen. That's the redeemed, the called out. How many know Israel is the model for the church? Zion, we we call churches Zion. That's Jerusalem. Read your Bible. And so when you actually preach the word of God, you got to be selective what you give them. Give them milk before you try to get them to digest meat. Eventually, all of you ought to be teachers, Hebrews says. And guess what? If not, you got to go back to drinking milk because you got to go with the first principles because you can't build a house without building a foundation. So four things that we consider to be preaching principles. Preaching principles, you'll see that on the page after differentiate fallow ground from fertile soil. Did I give you that point? Differentiate fallow ground from fertile soil. So there we have four lines. Number one, the first thing you want any preacher, including the lead pastor, to be is anointed. Say anointed. Anointed means that you know how to speak to the spirit of a man. Because until you speak to the spirit of a man, you can't change their mind until you change their spirit. Because you won't receive from a person's knowledge until you get a revelation. See, the the problem with people that come in unsaved is they mentally can't connect with you because they're spiritually dead. What you might not realize it is when a person comes in your church, they're a Lazarus. They're dead four days, they stinketh. And so your job is to speak life into dead things. They should have got an amen right there. I could preach a whole sermon off of that. Speaking life into dead things. So when you're anointed, you're able to speak to the spirit of a person. Because if you don't penetrate their spirit, you'll never get their heart. Because the heart is the core of their spirit. So aim at their spirit, you'll get their heart. The second thing is to be authentic. And that's where you speak to the heart. And you've heard me say already, if you speak from the heart, you can penetrate the heart. So you can't speak to the heart until you know what's in yours. Well, I'm preaching this sermon today, but, you know, it's like if you go online and just Google the angry preacher, you'll see that not everybody in the pulpit is sanctified. So people get in the pulpits and preach messages that are theological, they're exegetical, they might be, uh, 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 they might be based on exposition, they might exegete the text well and isogete, exogete, they give you all that good stuff, homiletics, hermeneutics, all that. They can give it to you all, but if their heart's in the wrong place. How can you speak to a group of people who have messed up hearts when yours is messed up? So you got to not only speak under the anointing, you got to speak authentically. The third thing is you got to articulate. This is where you capture the mind of the educated, the businessman. Come on, the, uh, the elite person that says, wait a minute, this religion stuff and faith, that's all for people that need a crutch. But I'm educated. I know the, uh, the ways of the world. I'm wise according to the ways of the world. Well, you need to show them that the wisdom of a man is not as wise as even the foolishness of God. Because miracles are foolishness. They don't make no sense. But when your miracle makes more sense, makes more sense than what they learned in the world, then all of a sudden the mess becomes the message. Because God allowed you to get to the mess so he could make a miracle out of the mess or the mess could be the message. Because your Egypt is preachable. The problem is we want to preach about the promised land. We don't want to talk about our Egypt. How do we get where we're at? And we definitely don't want to talk about the wandering and the wandering in the wilderness. Because it would show that we don't always have it together. So speak to the spirit. Speak to the heart. Speak to the mind. Be articulate. 
know what you're talking about, and please don't preach something that you haven't handled well. Now, I know a person that cut off their fingers trying to cut wood with a saw that they had no power to hold. Therefore, they turned it on and it had more power than the power in their hand. Therefore, they cut off fingers because they weren't skilled in how to use that machinery. Don't try to preach Hebrew and Greek if you don't know Hebrew and Greek. Just say, well, the Greek says, don't try to pronounce stuff that you don't know how to pronounce. And the Greek word is shalibaba. What? No, 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 no. You might as well just speak in tongues. Shikamana Kanda. Come on, just, you know, you might as well make up words because that's what we're doing in the pulpit. We're making up stuff. And the Jewish person that walked in said, how dare they butcher my language? You might have an authentic Greek person come into your doors and say, that's not Greek. That's gibberish. The Jewish person says, that's just Meshugana. That means you are crazy, and this is a bunch of misogos. It's chaos. You cannot convince the Jewish doctor or lawyer that you know what you're talking about from the Old Testament when you don't speak Hebrew, but you're pretending to know Hebrew. Now, guess what? If you want to know Hebrew, I got a class for you. Do you want to know some Greek, biblical Greek and Aramaic? We can, we can do something with that. But if you're going to pretend to know stuff you don't know, it's like talking about being an architect. and You've never been trained to be an architect. You can't build what you don't know how to build. So we need to be authentic, articulate. Here's the last one, authoritative. This is where now we can speak to the stronghold. How many want to pull down those strongholds? You can't pull down what you're not willing to speak to. David knew how to speak to Goliath because he knew the battle with Goliath was a war of words. Did you know that the Philistines, their greatest weapons were words? Do you understand that Goliath tried to talk him down before he tried to knock him out? And it's actually David that knocked him out after he talked him down. You uncircumcised Philistine. Now, you, you, why is that in the text? Why you got to get all under the covers like that? Why you got to talk about, I don't want to know about his anatomy. No, you don't understand. Circumcision is a covenant right that Abraham circumcised his, not only his son, Isaac, uh, but he also circumcised Ishmael at 13, which is why to this day, 13 years old is a bar mitzvah age of accountability. You come into the accountability of stepping into manhood at 13. The process is before that, but you get qualified at 13. Girls are smarter, so they start at 12. And all the women say, amen. No. You know what women are smarter at? They're more emotionally, in, in emotionally intelligent. Men, we know how to show a couple of different emotions. When we're happy and when we're what? Mad. No, you're right, hungry. It's called hangry. When you're hangry, that's what you know how to show, but you don't know how to show a lot of emotions. Women, they have a whole color wheel of emotion. Well, this is the way I'm feeling today, and da 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 My wife starts telling me how she feels, and I'm going, come on, get it out. What's the bottom line? What are you trying to say? But I have to sit there, and i got to listen, because, see, I want to hear with my ears to go into my mind, but I need to hear from my heart. How about your church? The, in the spirit, there's a whole color wheel of expression. So your messages have to have some rise and fall to it. It can't always be in fifth gear screaming at your congregation. Because now you sound not just hangry, but angry. The angry preacher. I mean, that's just sad, isn't it? We get labeled as angry preachers because... They're always preaching about money. They're always preaching about this and that. They're always preaching about sin. Why are you looking at me when he's preaching that? That's what they're thinking. Because we don't realize our emotions get more involved in our spirit. And until we speak authoritatively, we can't speak to the stronghold. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is message mapping. We need to map out our message. That means our messages need to have a, a kind of map of where we're going. And so mapping out the message, I'm going to give you five things to help you map out your messages. The first thing you need to have in your message is an introduction. The worst thing is to hear a preacher get up and just in fifth gear start preaching like they're Superman, like jumping on tables like you're Tom Cruise or couches, whatever he did. I mean, guess what? You, you, you do realize your people need to warm up to you before they warm up to what you're saying? In fact, there needs to be a likability factor. You know, Simon Cowell knows about that because there has to be a likability factor. You might have talent, but if I don't like you, 
then I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna love you. Because likability is important. Your personality matters. Because God could have chose anybody, but he chose you. That means he chose somebody, not somebody else's personality, but yours. So when you try to sound like T.D. Jakes in the pulpit, guess what? It don't work. Because you can't sweat as good as he can and still stay anointed. Your sweat messes you all up. I mean, you uh, makeup starts dripping, ladies. Come on. Hair is a mess. Shirt gets all undone, tucked in. Let me tell you, T.D. Jakes might sweat, but he never loses who he is when he sweats. He still looks sharp in that suit, right? He might sweat that thing up, but you'd never know it because the whole thing sweats one color. It was gray. Now it's smoke gray. He's just cool when he sweats. He just, he just is. He's a mastermind at mapping out his message. You start with an introduction. And this is where you familiarize your audience with the biblical text and topic. The second thing is identification. If people can't identify with you, they feel that you're preaching at them and not to them or preaching along with them. Because they should feel like you literally got alongside them and said, come on, let me help you with this. Let me walk you through this. Let me be your Aaron and your her, Moses. Come on. Let me walk you through this stage. Come on. We're going through this Red Sea together. And sometimes people feel that we're up on pulpits preaching at them. That's why I wanted to be down here today, because we're all pastors and leaders in this place. And I want you to know that we, our message is, is kind of unana- uh, uh, unanimously saying one thing with one sound. It's united in its voice. So that the pastor's message, the youth pastor's message, come on, the associate's message, the executive pastor's message, the children's director's message, the guy heading up your volunteers, their message, the greeter at the door, the parking lot, per, parking lot person, they all had the same voice because they sound like the pastor. In fact, they meet the pastor before they ever meet the pastor. They meet them through the people that are serving in your ministry. So what if your messages can communicate like we're talking together, like it's a family talk? You know, if you have a family meeting, get everybody in on the same page. The, th- the third thing is illumination. This is where we take your vision, what you heard from God, and we take it to enlightened revelation. Because, see, the eyes of my understanding have, be- have to be enlightened through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You got it, but did they get it? Okay, Uh, number uh, four is implementation. Implementation, this is putting the plan into action. Your messages should give them steps of action, probably through your points. Point one should lead to point two, should lead to point three. Don't make me take a leap of faith because it made no sense going from that verse to that one because there's no connection. There's no gradual progression. How did you go there, preacher? You lost me at hello. You got to allow people to follow step by step so that you're leading them. And the last one is inspiration. This is where we're, our goal is to inspire people, stimulating in them a strategy for success. Because you want them to win or, or you want to look good so that you look better and they look worse. What's your goal? Well, when I'm praying and when I'm praising and when I'm doing this and that and all this stuff, what happens is you sound better but they never get better because you sound like you're here and they should all from down there come up to your level when instead you should be coming down to their level and say, let's go up the mountain together, Joshua. Now you might stop at your leadership. You can go halfway up the mountain, but Joshua, you're further along than the people. They're at the base of the mountain. Did you ever think about the base of the mountain? That's the outer court. Did you ever think about Joshua? He's in the holy place. But the cleft of the rock is the holy of holies. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's the vision. But what if you could get the vision down to the people? So now there's application. That is where the real challenge begins. So I'm going to share with you that there are nine things that you could possibly use um, in your leadership. You're just going to write these in your notes, but we're going to make this available to you along with a resource I'm about to go over in the next couple of minutes. And it's um, one on a certain topic. I'm going to give you topics. I'm going to yell them out to you quickly. Nine things. Just write it down. Number one, family. Somewhere in your year, you should take a cycle of harvesting your crops. And one of the crops you should harvest is healthy families. That might include marriage, parenting, blended families, family roles, goals. Number two, You're going to have to talk about relationships if you talk about family. 
Because how many know families are built on a relationship? So in relationships, you might talk about friendship, fellowship, dating, purity, soulmates, soul ties. It's all under relationships. That should be one of your sermon series for the year. Think of it on a year's basis. Nine things over 12 months stretching out, maybe some things you want to talk about two months or, or six weeks long. Or you might have some tweener messages in between, three sermons. But nonetheless, these nine topics. The third one, the one we're going to talk about today is leadership. You could talk about vision, mission, influence, mentorship, discipleship. All of these things are part of leadership. The other things we won't touch today, but you'll talk about finances. How about worship? How about prayer? You should always have a series somewhere in your year about prayer because prayer, if it's a house of prayer for all nations, you should be a church that prays. And you got to teach them how to pray. Jesus, teach us how to pray. And then after prayer, maybe there's evangelism. You got to have some outreach in your church, witnessing how to invite. Here's a big topic. We always preach this one a lot, theology. Now, if you do a series on the Holy Spirit, that's theology. If you do a series on faith, that's theology. If you talk about the attributes of God, that's theology. If you talk about sanctification, that's theology. But you can't preach theology all the time because you're not preaching to Bible college students. You're preaching to people that hurt, that come in looking for a Band-Aid when they really need an operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Number nine. Spiritual growth. Now, this can deal with more than theology, but real personal spiritual growth. It starts with salvation. It continues with healing. It might deal with health. It can deal with deliverance. It can also talk about personal faith in the life of that person or personal devotional life. How about repentance? We don't preach repentance anymore. So these are the nine things you could cover. So again, that was number one, family, two, relationships, three, leadership, four, finances, Five, worship, six, prayer, seven, evangelism, eight, theology, and number nine was what? Spiritual growth. Now, that, that's kind of one of the areas that I cover, spiritual growth. So I had to really stretch myself when Pastor Bet said, hey, it's time for one of our leadership goal series. I said, leadership goal series. Well, what he was doing was thinking of every single time he had preached on leadership, and he's put it in his own brain together as a leadership goal series. I said, I didn't even know we had a leadership goal series. But guess what? I finally realized when he began to re review, well, remember what we did last year on leadership? Oh, that's right. Remember what we did the year before? Oh, that's right. Last, the previous years, we did do leadership. How I many know in your church, you should always have a sermon series on leadership? Or you'll never have any leaders. You'll just have followers. So leadership, just summer of 2014, we put together a series called Pencils. We're going to make this available to you. Uh, if you can go on Facebook and, and like passionate pastors and uh, you can do the same thing with Twitter and Instagram and those kind of things. Uh, like us on Facebook especially. We will make this resource available to you. And I'm going to give you seven principles of leadership in a very short amount of time before we have lunch uh, based upon the word pencils. And I'm going to explain to you for a second how we came up with this. So we said we know it's summertime. And if you understand the difference between Winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you got to do is call. You know that really it starts in the spring to summer, summer to fall, summer to winter. Think about what spring's all about. Spring is about new growth, new believers, baptisms, maybe a salvation class. All these kind of things go on in your church during Easter time, during the springtime. People come to your church during that time. How many know you get an influx of people during the spring? Now you got all these spiritual babies. What are you going to do in the summertime when they're running around and looking for activities? You give them summer programs. You get them involved in the church. You have all kinds of levels of, of things that they can get involved with in the summer season. There's an increase, spiritual growth, fruitfulness. There's the, the harvest coming in. There's a time for enlightenment and refreshing because, you know, people get thirsty in the summer, especially when you're in the desert. So you need messages that are refreshing in summertime. Fall. Everything falls apart during fall because now the winds of change have come and the leaves that were green are now turning colors and falling to the ground and their lives are falling apart when they were just spiritually on a high during their summertime. Huh? They just got saved during spring. They're on a spiritual high because it's hot during summer and everything's going good and now they have a spiritual fall in autumn. And now they don't know why their life is not as productive because you're not meant to be productive in the fall. You're actually supposed to harvest the final crops in fall. It's called the fall final harvest. You don't sow during that time. 
you reap. So your messages should be about reaping, not just sowing into them. We should reap some of the benefits of what we've already been sowing into you. And then finally, wintertime. Wintertime is dormancy, but it really is a time for pruning, reflection, clarification. This is where you pull your leadership in close and do team building. This is where you do your huddles and redefine your ministry and reshape it for the next spring. What if your church could work off that kind of cycle? Every year, I don't preach everything because if I preach everything, they won't walk away with anything. But I break it down into cycles called seasons. So this was a summer season. And pencils, the fill this in. Number one, the P stands for planning purposefully. Planning purposefully. Now, the reason we picked pencils is because Pastor Bed read a book about pencils. And he got inspired by this book. And I, I told Pastor Bed, well, what do you want to do? You want to preach from the book and offer the book in the bookstore? And he goes, no, I want to write our own. I said, okay. <laughs> you want to write your own? Okay, so, so we began to talk as pastors and leaders about this pencil, he began to talk about what he learned about how the, the holder of the pencil dictates how, you know, the, the writing goes. And if you hold it too tight or he keep it too loose, you know, it changes the writing a bit. And if you write too hard, it's hard to erase what's written too hard with a strong grip. So when you're too strong with your grip and leadership, you can make mistakes. It's hard to erase even with a big eraser. And so if you write too light, somebody can come around and erase what you wrote because you need to make sure some things are written in pen and other things are written with a pencil. So when we take notes in our staff meetings, we always write in pencil. And I write lightly because I want a picture I can erase. And so pencils became a principle from the pencil. We said, what can we learn from the pencil? So we started thinking about the construction of a pencil. And while they were all thinking, the Holy Spirit just gave me an acronym. And I literally came up with this from the Holy Spirit in about a total of three minutes. They were talking. I was listening because I, I, I multitask. And I just started writing stuff down. I said, Pastor, what if we do this? What if we have an acronym for pencils and we say P stands for plan purposefully? Because when you use a pencil, you're in a planning stage. And then E was empower effectively or efficiently it should be uh, efficiently and this is where we empower the people that that are going to be leaders in our church through this e of empower efficiently the end was navigate neatly because like an artist you need to navigate neatly because if you're a sloppy leader people around you will become sloppy leaders and then the C became create carefully because when you're in the creative mode, you need room and space to create, but then you have to be cautious how you create because what you create, the monster you create is the monster you got to live with. So you give a leader too much room to create, they will create a mess. Trust me, when my daughter pulls out every toy she's ever owned since she was 18 months, Guess what? In seconds, the maid just left, and it's chaos because everything's pulled out. Everything's on the floor. It's clean, but it's a mess. Sometimes our ministries are clean, but they're still a mess. Well, I got all the sin out of my church. Yeah, you got the sin out, but your leaders are a mess because they don't know how to lead because you never taught them because you were too busy getting the sin out. What you did is ripped out the tear along with the wheat, and therefore the leader that was growing like wheat is ripped out because you were too busy trying to get the sin out the camp. You didn't teach them leadership. Leadership creates carefully. In fact, they say the only time to really get weeds out other than plucking them when the soil is moist is the time when you're plowing and turning over the first one or two lay inches of layer of soil before you sow you actually do with those systems of weeds before you sow. Because if you sow into weeds, you got to grow with the weeds. So better to sift the soil or to turn it over or break up the fallow ground and find the root system of weeds early before you sow. Because once you sow, now you got to leave it to the final harvest. they got to grow up along with the system that you created. You let that leader get, be in charge. You put him in position. Come on. We train bin Laden. Uh, let me leave it alone. Number, uh, the next one, I, is for influence ingeniously. This is where you have to be strategic on how you're going to influence people because leadership, we learn here, is influence. And when you lack in leadership, you lose your influence. It's the most highest commodity in a leader is having influence. The L stands for lead lavishly. That means if you're going to lead, lead lavishly. Do it all the way. Don't give half 
of your heart. Give all of your heart to God. You know, when you love God in the Hebrew, there's only one Hebrew word for love because God is all inclusive. And in the Hebrew tongue, love is loving your wife, loving the pizza, and loving your job, and loving your church all at the same time. Because if you love, you love. What we try to do is from a Greek mindset, we say, well, wait a minute, agape love is spiritual, and phileo is emotional, mental, and eros is physical. Well, eros ain't even in the Bible. But it is in the Bible by definition, because in the Old Testament, when you love somebody, it meant intimacy. You didn't love someone until you got connected with them. So who you get connected with is who you love. And if you're not connected, you don't love them. So leaders that you're not connected with, you don't love them. Because you don't know them and they don't know you. Therefore, they don't have your DNA because they're servants and not sons. They serve in your ministry, but they never took on sonship in your ministry. We got to get them out of the slavery of being slaves and servants to actually being around you enough to be nurtured by you as sons. Because then when they get your DNA and character, in your absence, they still act like you as if they were you without trying to be you. They're not trying to replace you. They want to follow in the honor of their father and honor their spiritual father and mother because of that. So the last one is really what that leads to is they'll serve strategically. So serving strategically, that means you don't put people in position because of need. You put them not in just because there's an empty space. You put them based upon their gifting, their character, and their season. They're going to be a great leader in the next season, but right now it's time to prune. If you don't prune in winter, you won't have good flowers in spring. You might have good flowers, but let me tell you, one time I had a rose bush that was planted around the corner of my front door and the sunlight would always hit the front door and the rose bush was no longer being pruned by the gardener because the, the person that was supposed to be pruning it, uh, they were fired and someone overlooked the, uh, the, the, the pruning of the tree and they said, well, it's growing fine, it'd be okay. Guess what? One branch began to grow all the way around the corner of the house and began to grow like it was growing towards the door like it tried to get inside the door. Do you know why that was? It was growing towards the light. People grow better in light than they do in darkness. So when the tree was being neglected, it's going to go where it can grow. Because you don't grow until you go. And if we don't let people go, they won't grow. That sometimes means they don't belong in your church. Are you willing to let them go so they can grow? Because if they're meant to be planted, they'll stay. And so what you realize is the only way to control the shape of a bush or a tree is to prune it back because less is always more. Not giving them more responsibility, cutting them back. In fact, if your leader is not okay with not preaching every once in a while, your preacher, your, your young pa youth pastor or your youth leader or, or your executive pastor can be okay with not preaching all the time in your absence, there's a leadership problem. Serve strategically means you put them in a place where they can win and where the organization wins. It's not about them. It's about the growth of the total body. So place people where they can win, where you can win, and everybody wins without there being a weak link, okay? So this is uh, the, the last thing I want to share is just why we picked pencils. Pastor Obed said he wanted to do a teaching on a book of the Bible, and often we do a book of the Bible. Right now we're in a series called Trippin', where we're actually taking them on Route 66 through 66 books of the Bible, but we're only taking them to 18 locations. And so 18 locations, it's funny in Jewish culture, 18 means life, chai, like when we say l'chaim. And 18 locations is like the 18 locations of life. And so when you take them through 18 locations from Genesis all the way to Isle of Patmos, you go from Genesis to Revelation. And so we stop at each location to figure out what happened then is probably what spiritually is happening in our lives now or where we're supposed to trip to next. So we talk about hashtag life is a trip. And how many know life is a trip? And when we get people to do that, we realize they're on a journey through the Bible, but it's their journey. And so this is a two-month series that we're doing, not a one-month series. So there's actually 16 messages that we're going to get out of this. So we had to be strategic where we place the preacher. Guess what? I'm going to do Jerusalem. I was scheduled to do Mount Carmel, but I sat down with the person doing Mount Carmel and I realized 
they were lost on what to talk about with Jerusalem. So I said, hey, why don't we switch? And they said, oh, great. He went home and crafted a message in, in just six hours on Mount Carmel and Elijah bringing fire down from heaven. But for him, Jerusalem was too vast, too big, too much information. I said, I'll take Jerusalem. I'll be okay with that. I'll show my pictures in Israel. I can do this. I can do that. So all these things I can do with it. And I thought I was better suited to preach that message. So people need to serve strategically in an area where they're gifted, where they're called, where they feel fulfilled. And your preaching needs to be the same way. Your preaching needs to, through a series, go step by step on what is going to lead them to your end result of what you want to see happen. So the first question I asked Pastor Obed when he says, I want to do this, I said, well, what's your end goal, Pastor? What's your outcome? What do you want to see happen? Where do you want to take the people? Because then I can go backwards and craft it as far as research. And the reason I do that is because I learned that from God. God declares the end from the beginning. And so he finished what he wanted to do in his mind, and then he worked backwards. And so it's interesting, when you read the Torah, you actually read from the opposite side of the book. We roll from right to left. So everything you've ever learned, it's not that it's wrong, but you're gonna learn to put the pieces together in a way that makes sense for you, your church, your ministry. So at this time, we're gonna take a lunch break. And uh, again, we're gonna make pencils available to you. How many would like to get the seven principles of leadership from the book of Philippians from us, all right? How many are gonna go on Facebook and hit like? If you haven't done, oh, you said just did. Okay, Jessica. There, look at our, 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 our marketing girl back there, Jessica Petty. She is the woman behind. She's like the Wizard of Oz. She's the one that, you know the Wizard of Oz? He's the little guy behind the, the big, big voice. Well, sometimes us big voices on the stage, she's the woman that makes sure all the marketing matches our model, our structure, our brand, so that destiny stays destiny. How many know we're not trying to change your church? but we want to better your church. We want to grow you as pastors. Amen.